Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to the Soldiers of Cinema podcast. I'm Clark Coffey, and with me, as always, is the super groovy Cullen <laughs> McFader. I thought you were waiting for me there for a second. I was going to say something. <laughs> no, you know, I should have. I should, I should, I should have, you know, I, sh I should do some preparation, you know, aside from watching the film that we're going to be covering today. I should have, like, I, I feel like I need to give some extra time to come up with some really, really worthy descriptors, adjectives for you. You know, now we'll that this has become GPT, a thing. We can say, like, give us 18 million descriptors for, for other <laughs> podcast hosts, and then we can just go down the list. We'll never run out. So you're suggesting I should just use AI to come up with uh, content <laughs> here on our podcast. <laughs> I, you know, hmm, I don't know. I mean, maybe we could just, uh, we could ask AI to, to create a film for us, and then we mm -hmm. could ask the same AI to create a podcast for us discussing the film that it created, and then we just sit back and do nothing. And we'd get jobs at Sony or something, yeah. I mean, I'm sure that's, yeah, of course, <laughs> e easy, it's easy, no problem. Well, anyway, I guess because, you know, in the past, we, it had kind of become this running me, this running meme, but maybe I'm pushing it now. Maybe I'm pushing it. I don't know. No, I think, I think we're I, into it. I think we've got to, we've got to double okay? down. Is it okay? We double down? Okay. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Fair, fair. I mean, I feel like groovy because it's when I, when I see the stash, I think groovy. It takes me back to, to the seventies, which I know you didn't live through. And frankly, really not, neither did I, I was, you know, four years old by the time I was mm. out of the seventies. So I really don't remember any of it but i feel like you know the stash reminds me of the 70s which takes me to groovy and then i just didn't want it to be groovy cullen mcfader because i feel like you're super as well so yeah. there you have well, it so this little starsky and hutch kind of thing right? <laughs> i you know what i could see you in the in in like a reboot of that dude i could totally see that <laughs> Anyway, uh, sorry listeners uh for it taking so long just to get to uh, the start of our of, of the real meat of our podcast, uh, which is our discussion of my selection for the week, The New World, Terrence Malick's 2005 film. I, I picked this because uh, I know Colin's a huge fan of Mr. Malik and his work. 
And I also picked it because I had not seen this film and in, in maybe since it's like release on home video. Uh, so we can kind of jump in then to, to mm -hmm. personal experiences. And, you know, uh, let me start with mine since I'm, I'm already grooving in that direction. Right. Speaking of groove, uh, speaking of groovy. Um, so uh, way back when, when this film was released, I didn't go see it in the theater. And I, I have no recollection as to why. And who knows? I don't know. Uh, I, I just didn't go see it. Um, and I think, to be frank, uh, at the time, my level of exposure to Malik was, was maybe the thin red line, and that was it. And I really didn't have any kind of strong connection or association with him as a director. And so when this film was released, it didn't like jump out at me, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so then when it was released on home video, uh, I still uh, didn't even run out and go grab it. Actually, um, my one of my roommates at the time, I had just moved to Southern California and I lived in a house with a couple roommates and it was actually one of my roommates who uh, went out and rented it. And I mean, I did I was had no part in the selection of the film or anything at all. And so, you know, he was like, oh, hey, I rented this movie. You guys want to watch it with me? And I'm like, OK, sure. Why not? You know, and so it was kind of one of those experiences where it's like you have no expectations. I have no I didn't even know what the movie was. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He's like, oh, we're going to watch the new world. I'm like, OK, sure. Whatever. And, you know, and I had an in a really interesting experience with the film. So so first of all, I was just totally mesmerized by the by the film. It was like really uh, a viewing experience that stands out in my memory of watching films. So kudos. Um, I don't want to like just, you know, say somebody's name who like doesn't necessarily maybe want to be public. I don't know. But Roommate, you know who you are. Thank you so much for exposing me to this film. Uh, you have great taste, sir. So thank you. Shout out to Rumi. Um, he's a good dude. Um, but but so check this out. This is also kind of funny. So here's the, the it's like <laughs> this is kind of interesting to me. Uh, maybe this will be boring. But so okay. So my roommate, he bought like we live in this crappy house, right? It's a crappy old house, and um. He bought this. You remember those huge, like rear projection TVs, like Mitsubishi used to make. Mm, you know, and yeah, they're like yeah. they're like they're four eighty, but the, but it was like sixty inches or something, which would have been huge for back then. So yeah. it's like this s large but ridiculously crappy image quality. And they right? were like four three, three feet deep. Yeah, yeah. It's like four three four eighty i. It's and it's like that, and and every little. Every little ounce of resolution is stretched across this huge screen. So it's like the scan lines are just like, you know, an inch. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And and he also had grabbed this like used like AV, like, uh, you know, AV uh, receiver from somewhere. Craigslist mm -hmm. or something, right? And so picture quality, not great. Um, and the sound was like super weird. You know how sometimes if you have like a 5.1 or some kind of surround mixed and it's not like set correctly or you don't have the right speaker set up or something and it's, it can be like hard to, like the dialogue gets lost in the mix or something. I don't know if you've ever experienced mm -hmm. that. Yeah. It's like, it's condensing it, it, the five into two or something. something just, it, yeah. Something yeah. super weird. Hey, something super weird. And, and so I'm watching the film and I could not hardly understand any of the dialogue, but especially the narration. The mm -hmm. way the narration is kind of laid into the mix and the way the setup was, I, I, I would just grab like words here and there of the narration. I couldn't make it out. And and normally I'd be like, whoa, we got to change this. Like, I, you know, hey, I can't, you know, I'm missing something here in the film. This is unacceptable. But for whatever reason, I didn't. And I think it was because it just like, somehow even added something more to the film mm -hmm. it made it even like more of this like of a mystic experience mystical experience almost so it, it just i just focused on the images and it almost played for me almost like a silent film or at least like a film without dialogue um and it, and it was just an extraordinary experience it left a huge impression on me um and i, I it was the i think it was the first i don't know it it was um, Malik's style of filmmaking was something that 
I hadn't really experienced at that point in my life. And uh, it just blew me away. I mean, that, that, mm -hmm. so from an emotional perspective, before we get into the technical stuff, it was, it was extremely moving. And it was really um, uh, kind of broadened my expanses on, you know, especially because this is a studio, studio film. It's like Christian Bale. It's Colin Farrell. It's like, whoa, you know, this, it feels like it's going to be this blockbuster type movie, right? You think it's going to be, you know, some kind of epic adventure, you know, or something like, like a live this. action Pocahontas. Yeah. With, you know, well, uh, you know. yeah. So, so, or that. Yeah. Whatever. But of course it's not even remotely close to that. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and it really does kind of almost veer into like an, you know, experimental film, which is what all of his films after this one have been kind of labeled by the press, which is interesting. So that's mm -hmm. my personal experience. It was, I, you know, before we get, like I said, just technical, just speaking from an emotional perspective, I was just blown away by it uh, emotionally, just found it extraordinary. Um, so yeah, there you go. There's my personal experience with the film. What about you? Yeah, I, um, you know, as you mentioned earlier, like I'm a big fan of Matt. Like he's arguably my favorite director, if not yeah. up there. Yeah. Um, and I, like this movie in particular as well, would be one of I mean, definitely, I love all of his movies. There's not really any that I don't like, so it's kind of a fool's errand of me to even try and pick out which one would you be don't my need favorite. To. But I think we're not going to push you to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, but I think that if I, you know, in terms of the ones that I've I've seen the most or connect with the most on sort of like that emotional level, it definitely would be the Thin Red Line, this, and Tree of Life. Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of, I mean, which he did all in a row. Yeah. Um, I think that the, I mean, we did the Thin Red Line. I was thinking about it that that when we reviewed that movie would be, God, it was like four years ago now. Um, yeah. You know, it, was, it was 2020, which I, and so wait, when you wait, chose wait, we, this. We chose this in, in four years ago? Thin Red Line. Thin Red Line. We did thin four red years line. ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And so oh I was thinking gosh. about it because I was like, it's funny because we've only done one other Malick movie, even though. He's one of my favorites. I've always kind of been hesitant to choose another one because I'm like, right. oh, I don't want to do a repeat so quick. But then yeah. I was like, oh, wait, it's been it's been, it's four, been four years. years. Yeah. Um, but and so I think that this is a, you were in really middle school when movie. we did that one. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now I'm in high school. I'm almost Not a senior. Um, but I think that this is really interesting because it's almost like a a evolution of of that into something that I think a lot of people know Malik as where there's this weird thing where it's like, you know, back in the seventies, his movies were pretty formalistic. He had a lot of the tendencies of like the narration and things like that. But Badlands is a pretty straightforward story. Um, even days of heaven, there is, you're getting into that kind of meandering monologue thing. But I remember watching those and sort of think, okay, this is still pretty, still pretty formal. Like it's still mm -hmm. shot like pretty standard um i mean know, i feel if the it, way there's, the there's a there's a there's a standard nar narrative that you can kind of as an uh, as an audience member grab onto yeah and it doesn't it doesn't yeah. feel too like you don't feel too unmoored as like a viewer mm, and then, in those earlier um, films and, and so then watching when i watched you know this and the thin red line and tree of life tree of life i think would have been the first one of the three that i saw mm -hmm. um it, it's interesting like i think one of the things that really sparked an interest in me was just the fact that you like kind of like you said where it's like this big studio picture you've got this big budget you've got these you know a-list stars right in what kind of amounts to a a challenging of blockbuster or big budget filmmaking in that mm. sense not that this is a blockbuster but no you just don't see formalistic challenges um like the in the way that Malik does them here in terms of just kind of throwing out narrative convention, and right. I remember actually quite recently I was I was teaching a, a class to um, like a film class and I showed um, moments from a bunch of Malik's films to, to kind of um, express this idea of like you know filmmaking through feeling and emotion as opposed to plot and writing and and getting things in the audience's head via words and you know, specific action. Um, and I remember kind of my my prelude to showing them Malik clips was sort of saying, like, don't try and work out what is going on mm. in each scene mm -hmm. from a literal sense. 
just look at the images and listen to the sounds and listen to the words that the characters are speaking and feel something. And yeah. whatever you are feeling from those words and sounds and for the like ride. That is likely right. Like you're likely on a very basic emotional level in the right place. Because right. I think that that's the challenge I think a lot of people have with getting it. And I certainly felt that getting into Malik, even though I always really liked him, it it was a challenge to get emotionally connected for me for a while because of the fact that I think I was looking to specifically at like, okay, well, what's this character doing in this scene? Why does this matter? Interesting. Why? And so I found that, you know, as I got older and as I, as I rewatched a lot of his movies and things like that, um, especially here, especially with the extended cut here too, because there's even more meandering, so to say, in this movie ah. of, 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 um, the characters. And I think I sort of started to look at them a different way and realize that, okay, whatever I'm just feeling is right i don't have to understand on a and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about how like the the dialogue wasn't audible and that the narration yeah. wasn't audible and yet you still had an experience with the movie and it's like okay yeah because that doesn't that's not really the point i mean arguably point a is, better experience yeah, interestingly yeah. enough I, yeah. so so i i want to pause you here pause you here because mm -hmm. um, I don't want to lose this before we start, you know, really getting into the nitty gritty of it. So just uh, in case I missed it. Uh, so when did you see this film? Roughly ish. Like, is I honestly like... don't remember. I think it was probably around. So you don't have like a solid recollection of your first Yeah, I, I, I remember seeing like I do remember my feelings seeing it the first time. It was probably yeah. when I was in like grade 11 or grade 12. So. Okay. And you'd been and you said which you were familiar with Malik and his work. Yeah, so by the I'd time seen you saw the, this the Tree of Life, I'd seen when I was much okay. younger. Um, I okay, saw Tree so of Life around the time of release. Okay, and, and that then, was your first Malik um, film. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and then and this you... one, I remember, like I, I think that it was just a seeing it. I, I do remember coming away feeling like positive. You know, okay. I, 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 okay. I really so you don't, liked you don't have like a experience. strong recollection of it. And so, okay. I'm curious then. So coming back to it now, obviously. So it's, it's almost feels like a little bit of full circle for you in a way, because it mm -hmm. sounds like you, you, you don't have a strong recollection of having first seen it. You were younger and, but, but you've become a fan of Malik's. You've seen, you know, I am assuming all or most of his films at this point. Mm -hmm. So what was your experience this time? I mean, just emotionally before we get into a technical because I, I kind of always like to start from that point where it's like, yeah, okay, yeah. hey, hey, we're we're just like you're just we're just in, you know we're just an audience first, right? Mm -hmm. No, I felt yeah. I mean, it it it's funny to me to be so like I was completely hypnotized, so to say. Like I find mm. that that's what this it, in kind of very similar circumstances as like koyana scotsy which of course we did last right week. i thought of that too um, yes it's, yes it's it hip like you you get hypnotized by you know i think that's where malik is so talented is that he he has this ability to have scenes where seemingly nothing is occurring and yet you are brought in so i think emotionally for me watching it i was like you know unsurprisingly it wasn't a shock because of mm, course I've, yeah. I've, I've seen this movie since as well and um but i think that never an urgency to like look away from the, the screen in fact at one point when i i can't remember what i had to get up i think i was just like refilling my water or something and sometimes if i'm watching a movie and i'm not you know I'm, i just am literally walking three feet sideways and filling it up from the sink i paused this because i was like i don't want to miss a frame <laughs> of, of the movie so yeah which is weird for a movie that it's not like you've got to keep up with a bunch of convoluting twists and turns. Right, and, right. You know, keep track of all these. Yeah. And yet, I think that that's the thing is like you just, it brings you into this very immersive kind of audio visual experience, this sort of soundscape, and if you will. Um, and of course, you know, visual. Right, sure. The sure. visuals are incredible. But, um, and I think that that's, if anything, each time I've watched this movie, that's just gotten more certain for me that I've, you know, that I can it's, see it less as a as a movie that I'm sitting down and watching and more as something that you kind of like sit down and fall into and just get sucked in for. I mean, this is the extended cut is long, too. I, I've, so I've got it is it is. And and just to clarify, too. So we are ta we will be talking about the extended. Cut yes. Of yeah. this film for the duration of this conversation. It's it's the version. It's the cut that both of us watched in preparation for this discussion so uh just to kind of clarify that um 
Uh, although, I mean, I don't think our discussion would be terribly different if we were discussing another cut, but just mm -hmm. to, for clarification for everybody. Um, I mean, I, I'm curious, you know, just speaking emotionally, because of, of, of Malick's films, of all the films I've seen, and with this one as well, there, I, you know, as I try to kind of find an articulation for the emotions that this film brings up in me when I'm watching it, I mean, there's an interesting, like, melancholy. There's an interesting kind of... It, it it's almost like uh, it's it's right there's like a there's clearly there's a beauty but there's kind of like this undercutting melancholy it's almost like a the fleeting nature of things kind of mm -hmm. give gives it their beauty there's kind of it's it's a I mean, I don't know. It's going to be super cheesy, but there's almost like this existential kind of experience watching these films that, you know, you, you don't often have watching, you know, especially a more traditionally narrative film, certainly not from watching a you know, Marvel flick. <laughs> yeah, but well, I, I mean, do you, do you get a sense of this kind of this totally, melancholy, yeah, this, I mean, this theme that but it's almost like the beauty is kind of painful I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. do, I don't know. Does that resonate with you at all? Or am I just well, making stuff up? I think up? Malik has like a super sp specific point of view in all of his movies. And he's right. super in, t in touch with kind of nature and, mm -hmm. and humanity's relationship with nature. Mm -hmm. And I think similarly to the Thin Red Line where it's the Thin Red Line is, is, is not really a war movie. It's, it's a movie about humanity that mm -hmm. just happens to use a story in war to express those feelings sure and this is you know this is a movie that takes place during colonial times and yet the movie is not really specifically about colonialism it's more about the relationship of, of man and nature and i totally get what you mean in terms of the this melancholy where i think that especially the the latter half of the film when Jamestown is actually kind of being established and mm -hmm. and they're they're kind of through those rough winters and there's actually a level of of like a colony that's self-sufficient um it really starts to get very melancholic there's a point where yeah. you know you can, you're constantly seeing back to the indigenous people who at the beginning of the film were were living that life completely as they were mm -hmm. and yet now you see them farming and trading and selling um you know furs to the settlers and even living in houses in some instances as opposed to a much more kind of you know uh bare bones way of living that they would have lived before the the uh settlers and and it does feel very melancholic because i think malik's point of view here is that you're like almost like when you when you rip yourself out of nature and you kind of build this disconnect between you and nature as the you know the european settlers have mm -hmm. you die like you you mm. you you can't live like that like you lose your soul in this sense mm -hmm. and so it is really mm -hmm. melancholic to, like you said to see you don't really know why it's sad because it's like these characters haven't necessarily literally died um when they are now living in houses and trading with and living a more you know so to say european style mm. of living and yet in the the language of the monologues in the framing of the the images and the the way that the film kind of approaches that at that point and changes this tone you get this sense that something's missing and we get these constant monologues at that point about about like i feel like i'm disconnected i feel like i've betrayed mm -hmm. my mother i feel like you know mm -hmm. and so there's this really really profound switch in that it's super subtle i think you know a, a, another filmmaker um, approaching this would likely have done it much more upfront and in your face where it's yeah. like, oh, I need to get back out into the woods and see, you know, nature again. And yet this one, it's, it's, it's hard because the characters don't themselves understand it. And so I think it's, it's trying to explore that sort of sense where, which is, you know, the definition of melancholy is a feeling of sadness without really being able to identify the source. Um, and I think, so I think that there is absolutely this, this incredible sense of, like it's looking at this bigger picture. It's using this story but it's, of it's interesting Jonestown that, or Jamestown, you know, not Jonestown. Yeah, yeah. It it it's so interesting to me. I mean, and again, you know, like I often do, you know, I'm I'm kind of finding my way in an articulation of feelings, you know, live mm -hmm. in the moment. So forgive me, everyone, if uh, uh, you know, if I kind of stumble through that a little bit. It's just 
I guess the nature of, of me and how I work. But <clears throat> I mean, it it's interesting. I think, you know, even more specifically, it's it's his use of beauty, of visual, mm-hmm. of, of, of aesthetic awe to illustrate that uh that that growing disconnect um mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know I, I just find it interesting um a, a, in a particular way that he does it i mean just i kind of jump around here you know some things that kind of stood out to me i think there was like a couple and like i said this is the first time that i really actually heard the monologue or you know and no, sorry the uh narration <clears throat> mm-hmm. i didn't i didn't really have the narration in my first viewing experience, because just the, again, the way it's kind of laid in the mix, it was mostly not understandable to me. The first, you know, when I first watched this film so many years ago, um, this time I, I listened to it with headphones on. So the, the kind of the, the surround sound mix thing was not an issue and it was, you know, boom, being pumped right into my ear. So, you know, everything that was, was said in the film, I understood there's some like really interesting contrast. So, you know, with the narration and what's happening in the film, you know, it's kind of like when uh, Colin Farrell's character, when John Smith there, he's narrating and they're kind of coming into the land and he's, you know, is this, this, I, I forget exactly. I can't quote it exactly, but there's almost this, this very strong contrast or irony between what he's saying about, you know, free men being able to make their way and that this land is rich and theirs for the taking kind of, well, of course, we have the hindsight of knowing exactly what happened to the indigenous people who lived here, right? Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. kind of this irony of like him seeing it as this wonderful blessing, you know, if you work hard, you know, you can you'll be this, you know, your stature will be recognized or all of these kind of things. Well, of course, we know what the cost of that was ended up being for uh, the people who already were living on that land, right? Um, I don't think that's accidental. There's other interesting ironies between the narration and what's happening on screen. I, I, I'm, if you remember this, but I, f- I feel like, you know, again, it's hard to kind of place in the quote unquote story where this happens because the film is so much not about story, but it's like, I think it's when they, maybe it was their, their first journey when they, when they travel up river and they go to the quote unquote Kings, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to have some dialogue with the King. Right. And, and I feel, and there, I can't even remember the words, but I feel like it's like the, the Europeans are just like grabbing stuff like off of the tribe. Like there's leaves drying or there's food or something and they're just like taking it for themselves and Mm -hmm. the narration is (laughs) i for i wish i could remember i should have written it down exactly but i guess my point is there is like these really interesting almost humorous ironies except that they're kind of uh, uh you know the they're illustrating pretty negative things but they're almost strangely humorous in in the just the the you know how matter of factly they're the contrast are laid out right just how 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 the 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 um the irony is just so bold in a couple spaces there i don't know if you felt any of that but i guess in a a similar Mm -hmm. way that the the contrast or almost the visual irony of of the beauty but what 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 happens in the story which is a lot of what you described right it's kind of um illustrating a lot of different things but but the one that you specifically mentioned about humans growing disconnection to nature. Right. And, um, there's a lot of melancholy and sadness there. Um, and the conflict between these two groups of people. And of course, again, having the knowledge of, of history that we know now and what that ended up turning into, right. Mm -hmm. Basically Mm -hmm. a genocide ultimately. Yeah. Um, and of course, Malik would have known this as well. I mean, he's obviously, uh, would, that would be in his mind, I would assume as well as an artist. So I, I don't know I, where I'm quite going with this. Maybe you can help me articulate it more clearly, but I guess I just really noticed this, that contrast is very interesting to me and used to great, uh, effect in this film. Well, I think that the, the thing that interests me too, and I think something that I got very strongly this time was, and, Again, like you said, forgive me if I if I'm <laughs> you know all over the place here because I'm kind yeah. of working this out as I you, say. Hey, it, you but, know what? You know what? No, no, no. Um, it's okay. It's like uh, this conversation will be in the style of one of Malik's films, there you go. right? There this you will go. be 
it's like a collage. We'll have it's like a collage <laughs> of just imagine this as like a a collage of you know conflicting and contrasting uh, comments that kind of coalesce into a. Just a, you just gotta r buy a ticket, man, and take the ride and just exactly. feel it. You, you don't exactly. try, don't try to understand it analytically. Just go with the flow. <laughs> just feel what we're saying, yeah. Um, but no, I think that it's it's interesting in because there's this there's this kind of especially through history there has been this overarching kind of um, dogma that that the European settlers showed up and that there were these, you know, stone age people that, that were civilized. Right. And that, that's kind of the, the, that well, that was, was the, the, the narrative that was for, the, for a while. Not, yes, I, I think it's the, been a long the, time the, since that's been, you know, kind of uh, accepted, yeah, but, yeah, but, but I mean, these time, characters yes. in this, this film, that's what they're, well, that's what the assuming, Europeans right? at that like time that, felt. That's what they felt. It would have yeah. been, Oh, these, these are primitives. They, you know, um, and we're, you know, part of that kind of, you know, I guess like rationalization for, yes. yeah, for, yeah. for taking, you know, somebody else's land and home is that, okay, we're going to civilize you and, you know, oh, you know, oh, you don't know Christianity? Well, boy, we're here to introduce that to you as well, you mm -hmm. know, so yeah, mm -hmm. I think that was... Uh, the mindset of that era, for sure, or or even like you don't know how to build a wall, like you know a defensive fort, mm. and it's and it's this this interesting thing because I think especially so in the last thirty years, as there has been there used to be in in kind of academic circles this question of like well, okay, well why was you know despite the fact that they were around for as long as we were, you know why was European uh, culture so or you know technology so much more advanced yeah. than yeah. than um, you know, the indigenous people in the Americas, which across the board, A, is not even that true. There's There were cities in, especially in Mesoamerica. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the thing is, is that it, it this is where Malik, I think, is is really brilliant in this, in this film and what he's doing is that he's showing that it's not, there's no, just because technology may be more advanced, what does that mean about life and, and, and feeling? Is that, How does sure. that make it superior? Because then you get to, you get to London near the end of the film and everything's gray and mm. the people are, are, you know, just there's where, where is the, the life and the, the energy there. And you meet these Kings, this, the King and the Queen in this ornate hall. And yet it feels so sterile and so dead. And then you have that wonderful sequence where the, where they're walking around those manicured gardens and the trees are perfectly formed yeah. and shaped. And it's like, it just feels completely lifeless. And so I think mm. what, he does here which i think is really you know brilliant is just that he's challenging this idea of of this like european um you know enlightenment and it's like enlightenment for what's sake you know progress for what's sake progress in air quotes um because it seems like you know on a, on a on a large scale that these like you said it, it what did it lead to other than genocide really and why is it that there's this there's this understanding or this belief that um you know technological advancement will necessitate happier lives or more fulfilled lives and i think that that's really what what we're looking at here in this in this grand sense you know even when you get to the palace in london for example and there's this you know incredible architecture it kind of you you like that's one of those things that if you're on vacation and you're you're in one of these old cities and stuff like that, you're kind of like, oh wow, this architecture is incredible. But mm -hmm. after so long of looking at the trees and the meadows and the marshes and the rivers, it almost pales in comparison to, like this 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 beautiful architecture pales in comparison to the the natural beauty of this. And I think that he's very intentionally shooting this way. You know, he's yeah. very intentionally showing the natural beauty as beautiful mm -hmm. because of course there are certainly natural places that are gray and drab and stuff in the world. Yeah. Um, and yet I think that it's, it's about just this feeling of, of, of being alive and being connected. And, um, and that's kind of what I, I think got the most. And that's what this you time. get. Yeah. It, it, you know, something, something else I, I think I want to add to that, you know, cause I think one of the wonderful things about Malick's films and, and the new world, uh, of course, uh, 
as well um, is that he really invites you as the viewer to bring yourself to the film. And he gives so much space for interpretation, for active interpretation. Mm -hmm. And and I really enjoy that about his films. And I think you could likely watch this film numerous times. And each time you watch it, you could come away with something different being, you know, kind of your prominent takeaway, so to speak, from that, you know, from the film, from that viewing. And certainly, I think if you sat down 100 people and they watched this film and you asked them what it was about or, or what statement is Malik making, what do you think his perspective is? I mean, there would be some consistencies, uh, but I think there'd be a lot of different answers, too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I appreciate that about this film, even though, you know, and even though you say, well, hey, it's very clear that Malik is kind of using these two groups of people uh, to contrast, you know, one group being closer to nature and one group being kind of more more leaning into technology and being somehow more removed or distant from nature. And I think that certainly you could make a strong argument for that, you know, and you, you list some, you know, different ways that you feel like Malik has kind of shot and illustrated that. Um, I, I find it, you know, this in this viewing, one of the things that stood out to me so much was this almost Romeo and Juliet romance. Mm, and I hadn't mm -hmm. really noticed how almost kind of Romeo and Juliet it is in a way, right? It's kind of like these star-crossed lov star lovers, but they come from different groups and they can never be, right? Mm -hmm. Basically. Yeah. And, I, and, it's, and I, it's so... First of all, I just want to say that this... The way that Malik has shot... Like the first half of this film is almost kind of like a falling in love story, basically. Yes. And I think that's where you say, and then kind of like once John Smith leaves, it kind of becomes much more melancholy. Mm -hmm. uh, once that relationship is is no longer the focus of the film. For and both characters as well. like For both, both for, characters, right. yes. And we don't see uh, Colin Farrell's John Smith as much. We we focus on, uh, I think it's Corianka Kilcher. I hope I pronounced that mm -hmm correctly uh if not i apologize um focus on her and her kind of descent into melancholy and almost i don't know say insanity but her descent into a uh in, into a separation or a disassociation right where she's mm -hmm. an alien a stranger in a strange land she's separated from her tribe she's been given away and she has no home here in this strange place right and she wishes for death even um and but but I want to go back to the first half real real quickly because it's one of the things that struck me the first time and it struck me again this time is that it might be one of the most beautifully conceived falling in love s stories in cinema that I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. Just capturing the emotion of what it's like to fall in love and and bringing that to us in such a beautifully abstract but seeming but but also surprisingly specific way was is just um uh, just really extraordinary i i mean it's like <laughs> you know i always kind of leads me at a loss but i i just i don't know if that's but so that 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 romeo and juliet kind of storyline almost stood out more to me in this viewing and i kind of focused a little bit more on that but I think he uses that relationship really beautifully that like, you know, it's almost like we can come close, right? You can kind of like, you can, you can come close to kind of fully empathizing with a different way of existence, but ultimately we're kind of still bound by our fates, right? Mm -hmm. We're kind of still bound by where you grew up and how you grew up and the culture in which you grew up. And you can't really ever leave that ultimately. Mm -hmm. no, neither of the two of them can. Um, and, and maybe you can go so far at, uh, as to never be able to be kind of come back to your own culture, but you also can never really be accepted by this new culture. And ultimately what happens to that, the character who's in that situation, in this film is that she dies. Yeah. Now you're an outsider also to your old, your original culture as well. You're not, you've, you've, yeah. Well, and it's interesting, too, because when she dies, it isn't some melodramatic, horrible thing. Mm -hmm. She's it's reborn. actually quite beautiful. Yeah. yeah, she's reborn at the end of the film. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. interesting that he films that back, where she is back in nature and clearly ecstatic, doing cartwheels and dancing and twirling. Mm -hmm. 
but she's in the European dress. Mm -hmm. And of course, we end on this extraordinarily beautiful shot up at the trees and it's, you know, cut right after the bird leaves the tree. Mm -hmm. And boom, we're in credits. So well, I, I mean, I, this, yeah, I sure, just, go ahead. So, I, so I don't know. So I feel like like that really stood out to me to me personally, more than than kind of what you were, what what seems to have stood out maybe more prominently to you, which is like, great, that's awesome. I feel like that's a sign of a really great work of art, you know, is mm -hmm. that there can be so many um, interesting and act, like and deep uh, interpretations. But I don't know, so that, that just stood out to me. I was curious, like, what your feelings or thoughts were on that aspect of the film, the relationship. Um, well, it's it's interesting too, though, because I think that this story of Pocahontas and John Smith have, has been so, it's been told so many times, mm. and this is one of I think you know I've seen several adaptations. Of course, I haven't seen every adaptation, but this right. has got to be the only one I've ever seen that has truly, like, it it's not overindulgent in its depiction of these things it doesn't it doesn't it it only kind of it explores the emotional truth better than anything else and mm -hmm. the reason yeah. for that is because it's very honest with itself about you know i noticed in the the behind the scenes special features they talk specifically about avoiding the trope of the like so-called noble savage where it's like okay right. you get there and that these people living with the land are so much more like gracious and noble yeah and, like, no, they have their problems and, and the Europeans have their problems. And because of that subtlety, you kind of get this very honest, not not dour, but again, I'm going to go back to Koinus Kotze in this way where it's like, it's not cynical about it. It's it's more expressive about mm -hmm. the flaws of humanity and yeah. and how how we are susceptible to, to so many different errors. And mm -hmm. yet that's what kind of makes us human. And that's that also is what makes us, I, in, if anything, more a part of of that nature mm -hmm. um even at the end i think when when smith and pocahontas meet up in england and they're they're having their conversation and it's like yeah. you know that that this th those times that we spent together was it's the only truth mm -hmm. um and it's and it you can take that so many different ways you can take that as again you can take that in this sort of nature-based way that i sort of read it as but you can also take that as like the truth of of our the, the emotional truth of our relationship mm -hmm. and the that it's like what does he mean by the only truth well you know perhaps he's saying that that's it's irreplaceable that we can try and get that back but but that was that was kind of those circumstances were so mm. specific and so perfect for us and so it does there is this there's this layer of 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 tragedy to it but it's beautiful yeah. tragedy it's this it's this really um I think, you know, you're not, again, you've mentioned Romeo and Juliet, and, and there's so many great adaptations of that as well. Um, right. And I find almost the worst adaptations of, of Romeo and Juliet are the ones that get so melancholic and so so downtrodden with the, the ending rather than this this really beautiful exploration of this relationship. And so I yeah. think when, you know, I think arguably the most beautiful point in the film is as she dies... Um, and she describes to um, Christian Bale's character, John Rolfe, I believe his name is. Um, lots of Johns in this movie. Yeah. Um, and she says, essentially, she she like completely accepts it. Like you've got this this moment of, like you said, rebirth, where for, throughout the majority of the final half of the movie, you can tell that she is she is dying. If not physically, emotionally, she's dying. Yeah. She's getting depressed and she's she's unused to where this world that she's now thrust into and yet you have this renaissance right before she dies of perhaps this all was beautiful like perhaps this journey that i went on was the point and that's what's beautiful about it and that everyone has to die you know we all have to die yeah, and that she right. goes completely um with accepting that fate and almost in that returns to what she found the most beautiful about life and like you said that you you end on this beautiful shot of the trees and the bird flying off and um and i think that that to me is the best kind of you know rounding out of this story that i've seen and that's why i kind of say that it's it's i think the if anything the perfect adaptation of that story because it is so subtle and it mm -hmm. is so so complicated even though it's not a complicated 
you know, plot, no. so to say, it's incredibly complex emotionally. That doesn't mean that it's not yes. clear. That doesn't mean that it's not, it's, it's difficult to understand, but it's, it's complicated. It's deep. It's got so much richness to the way that it describes well, these emotions. It, and Yeah. It's, it's not complicated in like, you, you know, in, in um, it's not like uh, you know, like you said. It's not that it's not got all of these convoluted plot mechanizations that so many you know stories have, which which I think are are just like red herrings for complexity. Like that's just not for me. It's not interesting. Convoluted mm -hmm. plots over complications, twists at the you know movies that rely on a twist. I'm not generally captivated by those films mm -hmm. i mean this film is actually it's 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 quite it's it the, the plot itself is very simple the the things that the the concepts or ideas that this film is exploring aren't they are they're universal which in mm -hmm. one sense makes them simple but but also they're like endlessly deep in 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 insofar as that they affect all of us and they are profoundly mm -hmm. impacting on all of our lives and so uh yeah so i guess that's you know just kind of riffing off what you're saying there is that yeah i mean i think that that it, that this film is speaking to really deep universal uh truths or, or aspects of the human condition and of course like you said it's using this historical scenario as as just a mechanism for illustrating or, or discussing or you know uh asking questions about that those aspects of the human condition you know mm -hmm. um it's like it's for example it's not trying in any way shape fashion or form to tell the historically accurate story of you know john smith and when he came over and created you know that's like no it's in pocahontas and yeah it's it's not I don't think it's it it really cares too much about that at all. No, frankly. no, no. It's yeah. It's 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 about. I mean, that's the thing about. I think most of Malick's films, especially ones that are that are kind of built around a historical event, um, like the Thin Red Line. I mean, the book is famously fictional. the The book is about the Battle of Guadalcanal, but none of the events yeah. in the book are real. It's about a fictional right. troop of of, yeah. of soldiers. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that. You when you do that when you when you don't worry about it again again it's it's kind of funny because it just gets right back to our our conversations about Herzog which is just like truth versus fact whereas you're, like, right. you're getting much more emotional truth out and of a this, landscape of the soul um, the right? landscape of the soul um, by presenting it this way and by presenting the emotional truth of the ev the events rather than the the you know historical accurate yeah. Uh, events and I think Malik is also a really fascinating filmmaker because he's he's endlessly interested in these these characters that are like it's I hesitate to say the, the word fish out of water because it's not that at all it's it's more like these the there's in most if not all of his movies there's always one or two characters um, and in this one it actually almost switches from John Smith to Pocahontas when she gets to uh, mm. kind of is is taken into the colony yeah um but there's always this he loves to have this one character that is that is seemingly estranged in, in, estranged and in touch with something that everyone around them isn't and yeah. comes to this learning and this understanding that that's not a curse it's kind of in a, a sense mm. you know a a for lack of a better term a blessing in that way and and yeah. you know in the thin red line we get that with with um Fife, I think it's, is it Fife is amazing, or Wit, or whatever. There's so many different characters in that movie. I can't <laughs> it's okay, it's okay, it's um, okay. I but, wish you know, I could you help this, you, but we get the idea. You get this idea. beautiful ending to that movie where, of course, he just kind of accepts his his death as he's seen the world in the most beautiful ways for, for as it is, and he's almost, he's he's had his cup filled, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term. And in this, it's kind of the same thing where, where, where we have this um, character on her deathbed just ex going com with complete peace and harmony and and john smith as well kind of accepting that they had what they had they they've experienced those experiences and that if you try to artificially bring those experiences back and those feelings back that you're not going to get anywhere you're not going to you're not going to find that happiness again you kind of have to go on to new things as scary as it can be you have to kind of venture out into the unknown mm. of those emotions and i think that that's um you know, I just think that it's a really universal, like you said, universal uh, yeah. way to look at things. Um, I also, I, 
want to talk briefly too about the the score of the movie um both james horner's score and the music yeah. that malik uses in it and that i think one of the things that sucked me into this movie immediately when i first saw it was the use of wagner i love wagner mm-hmm. um and uh, especially the prelude, the Das Rheingold prelude, which comes much back to, in three much times. Much to Horner's this. chagrin, by the way. Yes, much yeah. to James Horner's chagrin. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little well, bit too, because yeah, it's yeah. actually an interesting kind of technical yeah. side of working with them. But um, you've got the, the yeah, the Das Rheingold prelude, which comes in three times, I believe. The movie starts and ends with it, yeah. um, which I think is a beautiful piece of music. I've used it in like a million things of my own. Um, and it just has that feeling of of like your brain waking up, like you're you're Ooh. like the world turning on and coming to life. And I think that that's so appropriate for this because it's like it's enlightenment, not in the sense of like enlightened era. It's enlightenment in this in this being in touch with kind of this this natural I don't know, energy. I sound like a a voodoo. <laughs> not, but but this like a new age you sound like a yeah, new, age a new age practitioner yes um, but it does it does give you that kind of sense of feeling as as they yeah. roll into these these marshes and these meadows at the very beginning of the film on their big ships and that there's like it truly does encapture this feeling of like what it would have been like to land somewhere in this complete unknown in this in this um you know and and be breaching out into this uh quite scary but also quite incredible moment in in Mm -hmm. um one's life from like an individual perspective um but then yes like you mentioned there's also this the james horner score which i think is actually really lovely i have that on my phone as well on on apple music or whatever um james horner famously not (laughs) very happy with his experience because of course as malik is chopped up the score and used bits of it in other places and james horner kind of said that he and didn't use a lot of his score at all yeah yeah yeah. and he'd written a very specific kind of story with that music and yeah malik of course as malik does used it sparingly and in in places where he wanted it but i actually do like the james horner score um but it's interesting too because that kind of i think is kind of the the recurring theme with working with malik is christopher Plummer also has a conversation uh in a uh round table an actor's round table where he describes that he would never work with malik again because in this film you know he would be delivering a monologue and malik would run off with the camera to go film a bird <laughs> in a tree or something and i think that it's funny because you just kind of see this dichotomy of people who really love working with malik like i think christian bale who's worked with him several times yeah. loves it um colin farrell says that he speaks about this experience as a really really wonderful experience Hans yeah. Zimmer, who did the score for the Thin Red Line, speaks. Jesus, what was that? Sorry, positively about it. He speaks very. Um, you know, he 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 talks about how the Thin Red Line was just basically making a tapestry of music for Malik, as opposed to a, uh, as a, a st- opposed a to making like score, a structured yeah. story with the the music. And so I right. think you just kind of get into this really. Again, not only I think at the beginning I had said that Malik was challenging the kind of the conventions of narrative and had challenged the conventions of like studio filmmaking but you also get that not only on the receiving end of an audience but on the the technical side of making the film that you are making a movie that is unlike uh the production on i think pretty much anything else Um, yeah which i think is really interesting i mean like why why feel the need to be so formalistic about it (laughs) i mean it's it's uh, it's you know especially you know now in in the almost 20 years since this film's release we see where the cinema has gone uh since this film has been released and it, it's you know i think we've asked this of several films that we have uh discussed uh, in our podcast and you know i'll ask it again of this one i mean can you really imagine this film having a wide theatrical release in today's day mm-hmm. and age mm-hmm. you know um, uh, I would, I would posit the hypothesis that it would be very, very unlikely. And frankly, it's, it's even surprising that, uh, that a, a studio funded this film's made, you know, a theatrical release. It's, uh, well, that's what I was going to say, even regardless of theatrical release, would this movie even get the funding period to would be Would you even in, get the funding period? Sense. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, it's, it's, uh, maybe a 30 million ish budget, um, 
I think it made its money back. But, you know, it's interesting to note um, that, you know, critical reception of the film is is not exceedingly high mm-hmm. and is very split. Uh, just kind of going back and looking at uh, like a brief overview of critical response at the time, you know, um, you have a group of critics um, just being, you know, just profoundly moved by the film and, you know, claiming it to be one of the, the best of, you know, the decade, and, and, you know, at the time. And then you have other reviewers who were like, what's going on, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. so I, and which I can imagine that this would be a divisive film. I can imagine, uh, a lot of audiences expect, especially if they're expecting a traditional, like epic narrative, historical epic narrative film are going to be disappointed. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but, uh, and I guess it makes sense. I can, I can imagine that, uh, that this film would be divisive, but I'm especially interested in those reviews or those critics who, who seem to get it, who seem to, you know, catch that vibe. And I mean, it's when they, I think you don't see many reviews that are inspired to a level of like poetry. Like if you go and if you read some of the reviews of this film, it's almost like these critics were inspired themselves to, you know, to, 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 to like it, to achieve a poetry of their explanation for why they liked it. You know, I mean, it's like, mm, yeah. I, I get, do you know what I, do you know what I mean? It's almost like yeah. the, the experience was so inspiring that the review is clearly inspired when you read it, you know, because it's elevated even their, their writing and the review somehow the experience, you know, um, which I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, no, I think but, that it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's it definitely, like you said, I understand the level of, of, people not being able not necessarily not being able to connect with it but perhaps just it not being their thing yeah um but it's funny because it is just total like i i think i said this in our thin red line review or uh conversation where i i described that i could watch a like 10 hour cut of this <laughs> and would be completely happy with that um so it is it is very much up my alley in that sense well, and, and, you know, and again, it's like, I mean, this is the wonder of cinema, right? Is that there's something out there for everyone. Um, you know, I, before we kind of wrap up, I, I kind of want to, you know, talk about, uh, and I'm curious, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm curious if you know more about, I mean, about this when, when I watch the film and I, cause I don't, I've not, I, I, I've not read a lot, um, or seen a lot of discussion on how Malik works uh, actually mm-hmm. like literally works how he prepares for a film how he you know how he works actually during production and how he involved he is in the editing god i mean i would imagine i'm surprised honestly that it's not like edited by him you know uh i see here listed there are four editors uh in yes. the credits yeah. and so I'm, I'm curious you know what that means but um but it's almost you know the 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 feeling that i get when I'm watching the film, if I if I kind of take a step out, right, and, and kind of okay, I'm 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 outside of the film uh, as far as like just looking at it being impacted emotionally, and I'm kind of looking at the mechanics of the film and imagining how it might have been put together. I mean, it it almost seems like he has just shot it in a in a collage kind of way, right? I mean it almost I can almost imagine him out there like, oh my God, this is beautiful. We need to get the, you know, let's come over mm-hmm. here and let's get a shot of this lake. Let's get a shot of this tree. Oh, you know, let's, you know, he there there are often just these the shots of characters just looking straight into camera, you know, just these almost look like f- just stills, basically. And you know, there's there's all these different pieces, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's almost like as he's like just whatever kind of comes to him, let's, you know, we've got a script, yes, but you know, and and it's, and it's just it almost feels like this was built by collage, you know, and then he kind of mm-hmm. but I but I may be totally wrong. It's just how it kind of feels. And then it gets into the editing and it's like, OK, where does this where does this feeling kind of take us? And it's almost I wonder if he edits almost in the way that we described. You have to kind of watch the film, which is OK. I'm not worried about literal story. Uh, yes, there has to be some of that, but I'm really worried about emotional impact. And so it's. It's just how am I? It's almost like it's this very intuitive sense that I get that he works from. Um, 
and I don't know, do, do, are you, but it almost just gets that feeling that it's like he's just grabbing shots, just things that move him in the moment. This is beautiful. That's beautiful. Or this or that. And then he kind of goes back into editing and it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go where this, where this flow tell, you know, where my feelings kind of take me, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, no, I think that's totally, I mean, I, I think that he, from my understanding is that basically the way that he shoots the film is he has people in character all the time and he will just approach mm. them. And that's why the set has to be so extensive as well. Like the, right. the building of the set was was basically authentic. Um, yeah, you can't just of, have of, like the front built and then yeah, nothing so, behind. Yeah, so that he could just walk around and find moments, and that every actor would just basically be in character. Wow, they would do a scene, and then he would move on to something else while simultaneously having all these choices of where to go. Yeah, um, and then the edit. Um, I'm more familiar with the process on the Thin Red Line, but I would guess that it would be pretty similar to this because the Thin Red Line also has, I think, four or five editors. Okay. Um, yeah. From my understanding is each editor basically takes a section of film and works on that extensively for the entire process. So they're not actually t- cutting the whole film. Oh, each editor is wow. just cutting, cutting sections. Okay. And I was that way Malik about... is able to give very specific instructions on what he wants for. And they, they essentially will cut together without Malik being there. Um, viewing kind of i guess work prints for him um mm-hmm. and then he will watch those make suggestions make cuts and on his own and kind of change things up and then we'll go back and and let them kind of continue to form it and so in doing so it basically allows these different pathways to form with the movie um hmm. because there's different perspectives on where it should go and things like that so then right at the end it's kind of all smoothed out and and formed into the final thing but um, interesting yeah at least that's i know for sure how he did it on the thin red line and again yeah. i would guess that that would be similar for here because there are a number of editors so um so it's yeah it's quite interesting i know that he also likes to basically edit like as long as he like uh, as as close yeah, yeah. to release as he can yeah um, and he's still <laughs> that's making the it. And that's i think I get, one of the yeah. reasons that his the score was was chopped up so much is because yeah. that he was making very big changes to things right um well and hence actually the one version cut, of this movie the... i've not seen is the first cut like the original yeah cut that was released um for oscar contention and basically they released it for a two-week window in like three theaters just so it could get into well it's the in the Oscars. criterion collection and yes and so which, i think i actually I might, well. I might watch that after i think um, I, I think that i might as well too i would be very curious because i yeah. i i'm pretty sure you know well i'm i'm certain that you know when i when the original when i originally saw the film i saw the theatrical cut you know that would have been uh mm-hmm. released just on i guess dvd back in 2005 um and then uh and then this time, of course, we watched the extended cut, like we said. So um, I, I couldn't because there was so much time between watching the first the theatrical cut and this cut. I can't quite put my finger on what those changes were, um, although it did seem like there were I was like, oh, this, you know, I didn't have a recollection of this aspect of the film or something. But but really, I, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so I have no idea how this first cut uh, might be different. So I'd be very interested to see that and to see how different it might be. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and that's one of the fascinating th- things about making a movie like that is is that kind of exploration in using editing as the, the writing process um, and kind of working out so many different things. And it's not about, um, you know, at least the way I look at it, it's not about the hesitance to make decisions on set, but rather yeah. just a different form of that process and i think that that's i think the reason that i value that a lot is i think because people get so stuck into how things are done Mm. on like if you've ever worked on a film set or or ever been involved in the production of something um you you people get dogmatic that people can get yeah people are like and and oftentimes don't have a better answer as to why things are done other than that's just how things are done um and so i think that having someone challenge that you're obviously always going to get pushback and clearly malik does get a yeah. lot of pushback from from critics and people that he's worked with alike um and yet you can't really fault him for the the quality of the of the output know, the pictures that he comes out with right so yeah i mean it's interesting yeah. uh, you know I, i've i've not made a narrative film like this but i have experience with documentary work and it it, it just for myself in my own mind it almost kind of feels like the way that i would work with a documentary where I would basically, 
set out with a question for myself as opposed to an answer. And you use the production time to explore the question, whatever this, mm -hmm. you know, whatever thing I'm curious about. And then when I'm in editing, it's, it's really an exploration of that. And I don't know where it's going to go, you know, at all. Mm -hmm. I don't have, I don't have some pre-planned, you know, okay, this is going to be the first act and here's the second. And then the third, I mean, I might have certain milestones kind of etched out in my, or you know, sketched out in my mind, but really it could go anywhere and, yeah. I, and I don't even know where it might go and and so I don't know as learning listening to you kind of describe what what your uh, awareness is of his pro of his process does kind of sound like oh that kind of sounds like uh how I like to work with at least in the documentary space and so and it's it's fascinating too because it kind of also goes again to that Herzog level where like Herzog describes the fact that he doesn't make narrative films and documentaries in any storyboards are for cowards except yes, i totally exactly. did like uh, arnold schwarzenegger yeah. or something instead of you do a good herzog <laughs> i'm horrible i'm horrible um, you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah we could go back um but no i think that it's really fascinating though to, to kind of take that out of it and sort of say like well i'm not i'm not doing this narrative picture like a narrative picture i'm just doing it in the way that I want to tell a story in, in a similar sense. I'm not doing this documentary like a documentary. I'm doing it to, to express something, to express a point yeah. of view. And however that comes about is how it comes about. And rather than having to divide, um, make some distinction between the processes of the two. Um, so I think, yeah, I think that's really, really neat. And I think it shows itself on the screen in a very unique way. Um, and I'm, you know, I love it. Yeah, <laughs> I, can't say much hey, else other than, yeah I love it. Yeah, I mean, I, f I figure that's as good a note to end on as any. Uh, I do too. I think that the, the world of cinema is a better place for Malik, uh, and um, and his, I, I'm, I need to rectify the fact that I have not seen his other films. Um, so, but that's great. It's like it's really fun to have. Like my my watch list is always just growing. You know, it's like endless and. Uh, I guess that's one of the, you know, there, there won't be enough time in my life to see all the films that I would like to see. Uh, but they're on my, they're on my list. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, as always, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I uh, feel like I was a little less articulate in this conversation than I often am, or at least I imagine I am. Maybe I'm, <laughs> maybe okay. I'm like never said, articulate. We have to feel. Have to feel. <laughs> yeah, and maybe that's just indicative of the of the of the nature of this film that it's you know, uh, it, yeah. Uh, so there you have it. Anyway, uh, I'll look forward to your uh, pick, whatever that might be, for mm -hmm. our next episode. And uh, everybody out there listening, we appreciate you. Thanks for doing so. We'll catch you next time.